Oxford Rail have taken on board all of the feedback from that initial release and this very much is a model that I can thoroughly recommend. Well hello there, it's great to see you. I hope I find you well. I'm Jennifer Kirk welcoming you back up here to the loft on Weir Yard. And today we're going to be looking at a locomotive that's actually been out for quite some time. But I couldn't help but notice that up and down the country in model shops, they do seem to be sat there on the shelves in a number of different liveries at a price that I couldn't ignore. It's a really great price for, well, let's see, is it really a great model? We're going to be taking a look at the Oxford Rail Adams Radial. It's a locomotive that I actually already had one from the initial production run. But I had heard that Oxford Rail had taken on board some of the criticisms at the time and tweaked the model. And I thought at the prices I was seeing it, it was worth a second look. So I'd like to thank Oxford Rail, who very, very kindly sent over the Southern Railway liveried version of the Adams Radial for me to take a good close look at. Is this a locomotive that has had all of the niggles worked out of it? And is it an amazing bargain at the price that you can find it at on sale today? Let's take a good close look and find out. Support for today's video comes from Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders and accessories designed by enthusiasts for enthusiasts. And we will be doing a full DCC fit on this model using the Trainomatic 8 pin decoder. So stay tuned for that towards the end of the video. Additional support also comes from PD Models, makers of some amazing 3D printed model kits in N and double O, and also a whole range of detailing parts to really make your model build something incredibly special. Also, don't forget that we've got some links in the description box down below that take you to where you too can pick up one of the models featured in today's video if you really like what you see. Without further ado, the Adams Radial from Oxford Rail. Let's take a closer look. The Adams Radial is a locomotive that in modelling terms is a little bit like waiting for a bus at a bus stop. Three were announced in rapid succession after a fallow period going back well to the dawn of model railways. They were a class of locomotive that uh, really survived by quirk of fate. And certainly I was first made aware of the existence of this class as a small child when one of them was illustrated in one of the Thomas the Tank Engine books when Stepney goes to visit uh, the uh, railway on the Isle of Sorda. Uh, one of the things that Stepney talks about is the other locomotives back on the Bluebell line, including Captain Baxter, but also the locomotive referred to as Adams, which was the single preserved example of this venerable Victorian class of locomotive. And a little bit like the BT Well tank, these survived purely by quirk of fate of their accidental suitability for an awkward outpost on the rail network. Looking to the bottom of this, we've got a catalogue number of OR76AR006, and this is the Adams Radial in Southern livery as 3520. Now, there were 71 of these locomotives built, and uh, they were initially built for suburban work around the London area, and um, in fairly short order, they were replaced by the T1440 class of locomotives. Um, but actually, they were moved out towards the countryside, and um, it was discovered that the locomotives were actually perfectly suited for a very tricksy line, the Lim Regis branch, which featured some really, really tight curves, which uh, were quite troublesome for more conventional locomotives. Now, they tried out the Stroudley Terriers on that line. The uh, O2 class as well were tested out on there. And actually, neither of those worked particularly well. But this, by then, quite an old class of locomotive was found to be very, very suitable with just some minor modification to the trailing radial truck. Um, 
they actually were perfect for that Lem Regis branch. Now, the First World War probably saved most of those 71 from being withdrawn. They'd have gone by 1918 otherwise. And actually, during the First World War, a number of these locomotives even made it as far up north as the Highland Railway on loan. Uh, the Ministry of Munitions as well bought one example for shunting at uh, one of their depots. Um, but the bulk of the class soldiered on. But then withdrawals were fairly swift at the end of the First World War uh, and uh, relatively quickly. I think only a small number actually passed into Southern Railway ownership at the grouping and all bar two of those were very, very rapidly withdrawn. I think that uh, a number did get Southern Railway numbers, but it's not clear whether they actually received a repaint and I suspect they just received the E prefix to their original London and South Western Railway number. Now these locomotives were of the Atlantic wheel arrangement, the 442, and uh, the reason for this was that essentially they were an enlarged 440 type locomotive with the addition of the radial truck just to help support that larger coal bunker to give these locomotives the range. The radial truck at the rear is actually what gave the class their name of the Adams Radial. And um, they're certainly a slightly strange looking, very Victorian locomotive with a boiler that does seem to be a little bit dwarfed by this very long running plate that does stick out quite far at the front. But it's their curious charm that I suppose makes them very, very attractive in model form. And despite the fact that uh, by the time the early 1940s came around, there were actually only three of these in existence, two of them in Southern Railway ownership, and the third one that we mentioned briefly before that was sold on to the Ministry of Munitions had then in turn at the end of the First World War been sold on uh, and was actually bought by Colonel Stevens of the light railway fame and went to the East Kent Railway, where it actually didn't prove to be massively successful. It was a little bit too big for that line. And it was steamed, uh, they reckon, only uh, on average, maybe once a month. So it saw very little use. So much so that in 1946, the Southern Railway, very much aware that the two Adams radials that they still had left on their books, working that Lim Regis branch, were really struggling and um, their age was showing and the line really did need a spare locomotive which they found in the form of that uh, radial which was at the East Kent Railway and they negotiated to buy it. It was refurbished and pressed into service with the other two and indeed lasting into British Rail ownership and it wasn't until the early 1960s that British Rail uh, actually found an alternative in the form of, I think it was the Ivor 262 tanks after they'd done some remedial work on the track. And then they in turn were displaced by diesel rail cars very, very quickly. But it did mean that one of these examples was uh, saved by the Bluebell Railway. There was an attempt to preserve another one, but that didn't come to fruition. So enough about the history of the class. What do we get in the box? Well, the locomotive itself comes uh, and it's resplendent in this really quite nice Mansell olive green livery, which um, I really do think suits so much all of the locomotives that received it. And of course, the two that were a stalwart of the Southern Railway fleet did eventually get this, uh, this colouring. When they were renumbered, uh, they lost their duplicate series numbers because originally um, they were numbered very haphazardly by the London and South Western Railway. They didn't tend to just assign a block of numbers for a locomotive classes being built. Instead, they just picked out whatever gaps there were in the number sequence. So consequently, it's very difficult to anticipate what numbers the locomotives should have got. Um, by the time they reached uh, Southern Railway ownership, a three was then eventually added to replace that front zero. And then it was British Rail, which actually went, you know what, come on now, and uh, numbered them in three consecutive numbers. So the British Rail number 
doesn't actually follow what the Southern Railway number had been. Now, Oxford Rail have introduced these in a number of different liveries, and there's quite a few of these still available on the market from a number of shops. The um, Southern Olive Green here is certainly one that caught my eye and is currently available for what is actually in the grand scheme of things a really great price, which is what has attracted me to taking a look at these Oxford Rail models, which have perhaps in some respects been overshadowed by all of the models that have been released subsequently, but nonetheless offer some incredible value for money. In the box too, we've got uh, some additional detailing. I'm just going to open this up and see what we get. First up is the brake rigging for underneath the locomotive. Uh, this is left for the user to fit. Um, reasonably simple. Uh, we also get a uh, front coupling. Let's just get that out. Uh, which, if you wish to add this to the front of the locomotive, there is a NEM pocket for that. And we do get some other minor detail, including some draw hooks and representations of uh, three link couplings and a couple of other detail pieces in the form of lifting eyes. And I believe that these only need to be added on certain versions of the model. Other liveries that uh, Oxford Rail have introduced do include the London and South Western Railway livery, which I do have an example of here. Now, it must be remembered that these locomotives were rebuilt throughout their life, so they did differ somewhat by the time they reached the point that Oxford Rail has modelled them after. However, the preserved example on the Bluebell Railway has carried this London and South Western Railway livery, such that this model effectively is a model of the locomotive in early days of preservation rather than to suit that early period of operation on the London and South Western Railway proper. But nonetheless, it is really eye-catching livery. We also have that East Kent Railway model, which is an interesting alternative, modelling the locomotive that spent most of the uh, late 1920s and all of the 1930s right through to 1946 on that uh, very, very small independent backwater. We also have BR examples too. And it's interesting to note that all three of the versions that survived through to British Rail ownership have been produced in model form. Looking at these two examples, one of the things that immediately springs out to me is that uh, the London and South Western Railway version has the stovepipe uh, funnel on there, and uh, that is markedly different to the uh, more standard funnel on the Southern Railway liveried version. That's not the only detail differences that uh, Oxford Rail have tooled up for. The safety valve bonnet here is uh, present and picked out with the uh, red uh, spring bars on the top. Whereas the Southern Railway version comes without that safety valve bonnet and a few other detail differences in terms of the pipework on the top of the boiler. Turning both these models back onto their side, the other area which is very different is the crosshead detail. On the London and South Western Railway version, we have that much simpler version there with only the top slide bar and the simplified crosshead. Whereas in the Southern Railway livery, we have this much more substantial crosshead in terms of the upper and lower bars and this much more conventional cross slide mechanism within there. And certainly it's nice to see Oxford Rail having tooled for these alternative detail differences, it is not a one-size-fits-all. And it does make me wonder whether there are long-term plans, perhaps, to be able to produce these locomotives with some of the other earlier detail differences that would allow Oxford Rail to bring out more members of the class suitable for the London and South Western Railway period, and also the very early Southern Railway period, when a number of other members of the class did cling on for those first few years of Southern Railway ownership. Looking to the rear of the bunker there, you can see that the model comes pre-fitted with the lamp irons and also that vacuum brake pipe. 
The Southern version actually does have a lot more livery application than the London and South Western Railway, which is somewhat unusual because you normally would find that the pre-grouping liveries are much more ornate. But the Southern Railway version has this really, really nice typical Southern lettering on the tanks, the number there on the bunker, but a wealth of lining. And this is an area which can make or break a model, but we can see here that the lining is straight and true. Those boiler bands are not wonky in any way. And one of the other areas which can sometimes plague a model with these uh, having almost a join where the model has been tamper printed from one side then the other is not present on here. And we've got a clean line of lining that goes all the way around the boiler barrel and even gets right down into these little nooks and crannies underneath. On the splashes we've got that brass lining bead picked out really really well and we've also got this uh, sort of lozenge shaped works plate which is really nicely finished on there. It's interesting actually that uh, that differs from the uh, London and South Western Railway version which does have this sort of uh, oval shaped uh, plaque on there and it's interesting that these would have been replaced during the locomotive's life. The finish on the model is really really nice. We've got this satin finish which is more towards the matte end of satin but it does have that slight shine not too glossy which really does work so well on a model. The wheels too I think look really good on this. I was worried that they might look a bit plasticky. It's something that I found with the London and South Western Railway livery that they looked as if they were just plastic coloured and not uh, finished with a top coat of paint. But that has not been replicated with the Southern Railway version and it's really pleasing to see. You can see that the paint finish really does look good and hides the origin of those uh, plastic wheel centres so that they do look much more metallic. We've got a wealth of chassis detail there visible between the wheels and certainly this Southern Railway version does look a lot more substantial with this double crosshead arrangement. The connecting rods are again very very slender and it's something that Oxford Rail managed to do so so well as we saw on that Dean Goods review that we did last week. Couplings on this model come as standard in an M pocket as a slimline tension lock and you can see there the rear one comes factory fitted and on the front of the bogey we have the NEM pocket ready to take the example that comes in the detailing bag which is really easy to apply it's just simply a case of lining up fit in the tails and push into place and there we are ready to use this locomotive prototypically both forwards and reverse inside the cab we have a huge wealth of detail even though it's a little bit difficult to access you can see that we have got a whole host of gauges, back head detail, and it's all separately picked out. We've also got those characteristically very large square windows, and they are flush fitting both to the rear and to the front. Again, another area that Oxford Rail do really, really well. The lining too fits in so nicely on that cab, and we've got these whistles up at the top here, and they appear to be turned metal. They're certainly nice and substantial with no real risk of uh, them getting broken. The smoke box door on this model really does look nice. We've got the uh, dart on there, which is actually quite a fine piece. If we look at that against the light, it really does look prototypically fine and uh, doesn't look chunky at all. The front face of these models is captured really well and you can see there visually the difference between the stovepipe exhaust and the standard lipped chimney is really really nice to see and certainly it does very much change the look and vibe of this model between the different versions. Buffers are fully sprung all the way round, they're in good and tight, there's no risk of these popping out of place. Just testing the back ones too. They're on good and firm. Again, sprung at the back. 
That rear buffer beam detail too, we've got the drop shadowed number 3520. And then the coal load, it does feel like it's permanently in there. I'm not sure if it does come out. Certainly it's not loose in any way. But the rendition of that coal load is suitably random and actually does look pretty good to me. And we've also got that water filler too. Again, quite a substantial part. The rest of the pipework is in place where it should be. And the steps on the cab, they feel like they've got a little bit of spring to them. Certainly that's good to withstand any knocks in handling and usage. Same for the front steps. And uh, they do feel like they are very firmly attached, which is exactly what you want. Looking on the underside, you can also see that there's a number of holes in the chassis there, just hidden behind the radial wheels. This is for if you have a sound fitted version. And I believe that all versions that Oxford Rail sell are come either DCC ready or DCC sound fitted. And again, this is another area where Oxford Rail excel in that their sound fitted options are tremendous value for money. I believe that they use an ESU sound chip and certainly from what I've heard with the N7 that I've got, they really do have a great sound to them. So it's certainly worth pursuing if that's a route you want to go down. It would also be a really great value for money steam outline sound fitted model for any of these Adams radials to add them to your fleet. The rear of the cab too, we've got uh, brake detail in there. I'm just gonna try and move my light round just to see if I can highlight that. It's a really pleasing, almost like a cream, fawn brown uh, finish just inside the cab there both front and back something that does work really really well on these models and uh, you can just see there we've got huge amounts of separate detail the cab is actually really really nice they must have been somewhat drafty places for the crew when you look at them. They've got big, wide, open sides, and I suspect that in winter the crews would have improvised with canvas sheeting just to keep the worst of the weather out. But certainly, again, another area where this model excels. Those flush-fitted cab windows on the rear. Again, these are huge, offering the crew a really good view out through the rear and front of the locomotive um, but the cab back as well again really nice done not too chunky not too thick i am actually really really pleasantly surprised with this model fitting the extra brake detailing is quite easy to do just have to make sure that we orientate it uh, with uh, this sort of triangular section towards the back and then it's just simply a case of fitting these into drop hangers, gently pushing them over, getting them in. Just get the next one in. And it is really nice that these do go in pretty tidily and readily. I know sometimes with uh, some locomotives, these can be a real pain and nuisance to get in and out, but not so with this model. We we'll just click that into place and the model receives that really quite well. So from most viewing angles though, it's not something that's um, hugely visible. So if you don't feel confident in doing that, then I wouldn't worry too much. We've got some springy sanding pipes I don't think they're metal, they feel more like uh, a springy plastic, but they do seem fairly robust. Uh, and certainly these line up with the wheels. One of the areas that I should mention is that on this model, to kind of get around the fact that double O is much narrower than it should be if it was to uh, be modeling prototypically accurate gauge. If you want to go that route, you need to go for either P4 or EM. And what Oxford Rail have chosen to do is to hide this fact by having these uh, slightly elongated spigots just on the wheels to connect to the coupling rods. So that the coupling rods and the motion is in the right place. These all line up and true but the wheels are slightly narrower to the frame. 
One thing that does occur to me is that this may make them a little bit of an easier proposition for EM or P4 conversion because all you would need to do is to trim that spigot, move the wheels out on a new axle and actually they may be quite an easy proposition for the EM or P4 modeler. The front bogey is sprung in the centre just like on the prototype. There is a good spring to that and I know that on the first release of these models there was a small risk of the locomotive effectively becoming suspended between the rear wheels and the front bogey and losing traction but it, it does feel that uh, on this model it doesn't really have quite so much of a problem. That spring does allow a reasonable amount of travel up for this front bogey. And those front frames as well do look really good. We don't get an excess of air gaps through there and it does look a quite substantial model. In terms of pickups, we've got uh, some pickup springs on that rear radial wheel. You can just see them in there. And then we've got pickups on the four driving wheels, effectively allowing this locomotive to pick up from six of its uh, wheels. And it will be interesting to see just how well that performs on the track. The wheels themselves, as I've said before, really do look nice. And I particularly like the look of these front bogey wheels with their substantial tyres. And they do look like a quality turned metal wheel. The rear radial wheels too have a different outlay of spokes and that slightly larger diameter. And these aren't just a generic wheel added to the model. Each one is modelled accurately for its location. Running on DC out of the box was actually pretty good with some great slow speed control. But I'm going to now DCC fit the model and stay tuned and I will show you exactly how to do this. For this job we recommend the Trainomatic wired 8 pin decoder and we do have a link in the description box down below to take you to their UK and European stockist Tram Fabrique to be able to find the correct decoder for your model. You're also going to need the trusty screwdriver set and in case you get stuck the model does come with some very comprehensive instructions on how to remove the body and it shows exactly where that DCC decoder socket is in place. DCC fit is just a little bit more involved than some of the other models that we've done but it is still fairly straightforward. First things first, we need to undo the screw that you can gain access to through this hole in the centre of the front bogey. I'm just going to place that carefully to one side. We've also got two screws at the back here, one either side of the bunker, at the other side as well. One thing that I should make clear, because the instructions can be a bit ambiguous, is that you don't need to remove the front bogey from the chassis to be able to remove the top of the body from this to be able to get access to the insides. Once we've got those three screws undone, the whole chassis just pulls clear and we can see now the motor, which does actually appear to be a yet yeah, five pole motor, which does kind of explain why it ran so smoothly out of the box on DC. We've also got a large brass flywheel here, which just helps to give a little bit more momentum to the drivetrain. The rest of the model is fairly simple and straightforward. And what we can see too is that we've got the DCC 8 pin socket here, which fits within the confines of the bunker. And then we've also got what appears to be a speaker enclosure area just underneath here, which I'm not going to dismantle, but should you want to go down your own sound fitting route, there does appear to be space for a small speaker hidden away inside this part of the structure with the holes here for the sound to be able to escape. The choice of the decoder for in here does have to be quite careful and certainly direct fit decoders will struggle to fit within the space. If you wish to add a stay alive, 
you may need to extend the wiring but there is space just down inside there for a very small stay alive but as I would say you're going to have to run a wire all the way back to the decoder so it is going to be a little bit more of a substantial fit. When it comes to fitting the decoder itself we just gently wiggle free that 8 pin blanking plug and then we get our Trainomatic 8 pin decoder Just going to pull that off the backing and we've got a whole load of extra wires here if you wish to customize your locomotive we've got four functions from this decoder including one on the purple fly lead but uh, this model doesn't really need any of those so instead what we're going to do is identify pin one you can just see there with the little triangular arrow that corresponds with the orange wire on the decoder plug. And it's just simply a case of lining up the plug. Gently push it until you feel it go all the way home. And then we need to make sure that this fits snugly within the space available. And what I'm going to try and do is just tidy that wiring neatly into a coil around there and then get that in place on top. Let's just do a test fit of the body, making sure that no wires are going to get trapped in place. And that is just a little bit tight in there, so what I'm going to do is just try and reorientate this. So I've just used some captain tape from DCC Concepts, which is a really, really thin and easy to use uh, tape, very, very strong as well. So it doesn't add any volume, which is important, um, but it does just hold things like wiring in place for getting the locomotive bodies back on. Now, what I have discovered is that the internals of this particular release of the Adams Radial does have a slightly different internal bunker assembly. I think to incorporate the sound installation, the result of that is that there's slightly less space in this bunker area than on the original release before the sound models came out. But not to worry because what I've discovered is that if you very firmly just wiggle and grip on this uh, water tank filler, that then comes out we can lever out plastic coal load to reveal the top of the bunker. This in turn, if we unscrew these two screws, which holds what appears to be the recess that takes the iPhone style speaker, we can then flip that out and that gives us access to all of this area in here. So what I'm going to look to do now is just feed the decoder through and get this body back into place and then I can actually look to secure the chassis in place really really easily there's no risk of trapping any wires just need to make sure that uh, the pipe work at the front here is not trapped when you get the body back on. Just going to use a pair of pliers just to manhandle these out from the gap. So we've got those free, and that just fits neatly home. Screw back in through there, tighten that up. Don't over tighten because you'll strip the thread. And we're now in a position. Where the body's back on, we've got full access here. So let's just see about sliding this decoder down into place and fit that in. And we just need to carefully work that down into place. Now we do need to put this back in. The reason for this is because this is what the water filler 
just clips into so it will also just make sure that the decoder can't ride up and just uh, pop off tender top it's one side the other side that's all firmly in place what we can now do is reinstall the tender top that water filler just place it in and you can just feel it pop into those holes push it down firmly and hey presto actually what on the original release model was slightly tricky because of that very limited space in the bunker has turned into an extremely easy DCC fit on this version of the model. So I'm pleasantly surprised with that. We can now move this over to the programming track. I'm going to program it up as number 3520 and then let's see how it performs on Lear Yard. Running quality for this locomotive was surprisingly good. I know from my experience with the first release in the London South Western Railway livery that it did have a propensity on very uneven track to get stranded with the driving wheels held above a dip in the track by the rigidity of the rear radial truck and the front pony truck and it would just kind of spin and lose traction. That did not happen with this Southern Railway example and it's really pleasing to see that Oxford Rail have taken on board all of the feedback from that initial release and have used it effectively to improve the second release of this model. It handled a short goods train really really quite easily across Weir Yard on my very challenging test track area. It managed 5% gradients without too much wheel slip, although it was clear it was just on the edge of starting to lose adhesion. Even so, it did manage that short goods train up this gradient time and time again. It handled down to radius 1 curves, and also some of the more challenging of the point work, it just romped straight through. The current collection from the four driving wheels plus the radial truck on the rear seemed more than enough to keep this locomotive running. There's no stay alive fitted in this, but there was no hint of its stalling, no hint of hesitation, even across insel frog points, so I was really quite pleased with that. I didn't need to adjust any of the pickups, it was just perfect out of the box. Now with most locomotives it is recommended that you run them in on DC first even before you DCC fit them but actually I would found that this locomotive didn't really need that. Out of the box that five pole skew wound motor was really silky smooth even down to very slow speeds. There were no tight spots on this chassis and I could control it really really well even down to a crawl and it went up to a reasonable top speed that was actually more than enough for anything that any user would be likely to throw at it. All in all I was quite pleased with its performance and as I said before it's pleasing to see that the minor niggles from the first release have been taken on board and retooled for so really quite impressed with this model. So we come now to the scores for this locomotive. First up is build quality and with all the handling that I've been doing on this model not a single piece of detail has come adrift at all. Nothing has broken and even those quite slender whistles have stayed in place without any hint of going anywhere at all. The construction of this model is really quite heavy with some really innovative use of some metal castings to keep that adhesive weight up. So all in all I'm quite pleased with what I see here and I'm going to give this a 9.5 out of 10. On running qualities as we've discussed before this locomotive was a marked improvement over the initial run of the Adams radial. It ran smoothly without any tight spots straight out of the box so all in all a great performance with any of the niggles from that first release addressed in full.
It did struggle to pull a longer train up some of the hills, but that said, at 5% gradient, that is far more than is recommended on any model railway, and certainly something that really pushed any locomotive to the limits. So I'm going to give this a 9.0 out of 10. On DCC fitting and innovation, it was actually something that, at least initially, I thought that this was going to be a little bit of a tricksy DCC fit. I had managed to fit the first release of these models, but knew that space was very tight. When I first got the chassis off, it was obvious to see that some modification has gone on inside there, and this reduced the available space, at least without further investigation. As soon as I removed the rear bunker, it was clear that there was an innovative cradle to take the DCC speaker. And by removing this, it revealed a wealth of extra space that was not there on the first release of this model. This actually made DCC fitting even easier. And I'd wager that it's possible to DCC fit this model without actually needing to remove the body from the chassis if you chose to go down that route. With the additional space, it may also be possible to add a small stay alive within the bunker area, and certainly I was pleasantly surprised with what I found. It's also clear that a sound fit on this model is really, really easy. That is, if you don't go for the factory fitted DCC sound versions, which do offer amazing value for money. On accuracy and quality of finish, I felt that Oxford Rail have really captured the look and feel of the Adams Rachel really, really well. There was a wealth of detail, and the interior of the cab really is sublime. I was also really, really pleased with the finish on the wheels, which, to my view, the original release did look slightly plasticky. That has all been resolved on this model, and it really does look good. The only area which might draw a little bit of criticism is there's overly long spigots to move the connecting rod slightly further out to kind of just address the fact that double O is a little bit on the narrow gauge side. But from most normal viewing angles, that really isn't obvious. One small blemish, which I do need to point out, is that the packaging is rubbed on the rear bunker of this particular example. But this is something incredibly minor and not representative of the full production run. But as you're going to see it in this video, I thought it's probably best to be honest and point that out. There was also an ever so slight lean on the cab back. It looks more pronounced on the video, but I assure you in real life, it wasn't really noticeable. And actually, it took to see it close up on the video screen to notice it at all. So really, just a little bit minor. So I'm going to give this a 9.1. On value for money, this is an area that Oxford Rail consistently score really, really well. And these models can be found for under £100 from pretty much any of the model shops that I went and took a look at. In this day and age, that really is a great price. And what struck me as well is that if you want to go for the sound fitted version, that does offer amazing value for money whereby effectively you're paying for a sound chip with the sound file loaded on it and almost getting a free locomotive thrown in. It's not quite like that, but certainly it does offer an amazing deal if you want to go down the sound fitted option. So I've got no qualms in giving this a 9.0 out of 10. That gives us an overall score of 45.8, and this very much is a model that I can thoroughly recommend. Grab them now whilst they're out there, because I suspect that these are going to go up dramatically in price when the next production run comes out, and you'll kick yourself for not making sure that you stock up now whilst these are available in a multitude of liveries from Southern Green, BR Black, and London and South Western Railway Green, not to mention that quirky East Kent Railway, which gives you something just that little bit different. These locomotives were reasonably well travelled during the First World War, getting all the way up to the Highland Railway, so there's justification for so many people to include one on their model railway. Not least, Rule 1. It's my model railway, my rules.
Well, I hope you found today's video informative and I'd love to hear from you in the comments section down below to see what you think about the Oxford Rail Adams Radial. Is this a model that you've got? I'd love to hear of your experiences. Or is this something that maybe you're thinking about getting off the back of this review? Or do you disagree with what I've said about the Oxford Radial? I would love to hear from you all. Don't forget as well that if you really like the look of today's model, we've got a link in the description box down below to help you find one of your own. Also, we've got a link to our merch shop and some great ideas there for gifts, for Christmas, for birthdays, or really just for treating yourself at any time. We've also got a link for the JK Monday Club wagon from Acuriscale. So do check them out, they're selling quickly and be sure to pick yours up before they all disappear for good. But until next time, this is me, Jenny Kirk, saying you take great care of yourself and I look forward to seeing you then. Take care, happy modeling. Bye for now. Today's video is sponsored by Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders designed to be fully compatible with every manufacturer's locomotive. Visit train-o-matic.com to browse the full range and see what they've got suitable for you. Today's video also comes with the support of PD Models, makers of a whole range of 3D printed kits and accessory detailing that brings something special to your model layout. Available in a number of different scales and gauges, this range is sure to have something for you. So check them out at the affiliate link down below to see what they have got today to make your model layout something special. PD models are also well known for their museum quality models that can be made bespoke to order. So do contact them if you have some specific requirements and see if they can do something special for you. I'd like to send out a huge thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon. And an extra special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson, Offshore Allen, OORail.co.uk, Michael Lockie, Helen Sink, Peter Bolton, Brian and Dorothy Mudd, Gary Lewis, David Quinn, Sparky 10707, George Botterini, Chris Moss, Robert Steers, MD of San Juan Model Company and Grantline Products, Sam Yates, Dale Williams, John N. from NC, NYM Arish, Jonathan Foster, Peter, Graham Foster, Clifford Ison, Larry W. Grant, NI Railways 4000 class, Ian Coulson, and Alan Dickerson. Thank you. Without you guys, I couldn't do this. Thank <laughs> you.